What would an alien invasion look like? A fleet of monstrous ships arriving in our atmosphere. A secret alliance between an alien civilization and the government. One where the aliens have a hidden agenda. Or how about a covert infiltration where disguised aliens live and scheme among us? Did the invasion already occur long ago in our ancient past and we now live with the aftermath? Are we being tormented by invasive beings from other dimensions? Finally, could the invasion come in the form of a parasite, one which sparked the rise of human civilization for its own purpose? Our X-Vault explores this in Invasion. What would an alien takeover look like? The year 2025. An alien craft the size of Manhattan appears out of nowhere on the edge of the atmosphere. Debate rages. What are their intentions? Are they here to conquer us? Or are they here to help us? Maybe even save us? Have they been here before? Perhaps long ago in our planet's past? Or maybe they've been here all along infiltrating our society, perhaps scheming with the government. Abductions, cattle mutilations, crossbreeding, has all that been part of their game? Most importantly, if they are invaders and are finally making their move, is there anything at all we can do to resist? Caution, some of the possibilities presented here are disturbing. The hypothetical scenario we'll portray is upsetting. If you're prone to nightmares, please stop here. But the groundbreaking theories we'll propose about how we might be able to fight back, though highly speculative, might just save our species. First sign of a problem is when several satellites over the Atlantic Ocean go silent. Then the hull of a massive craft begins to slowly emerge as though through a doorway. No signals come from the vessel. Any attempts to communicate are met with silence. The alien craft simply parks in orbit while arguments rage on the planet below. What do they want? Military leaders now admit there are objects flying around out there that they can't explain, but instead our enemies have a technology that we don't understand. Triangles, but what are they? I don't wait around for a reply anytime soon. Many celebrate, convinced they're here to save us from climate change or to stop us from destroying ourselves in a third world war. But others argue that they had visited us long ago in order to enslave our species. As far as ancient astronaut theorists are concerned, evidence that there is other intelligent life in the universe has already been found on every corner of the globe. They believe Earth has been visited by intelligent beings for thousands of years, and that it most likely began during the time of the ancient Sumerian kings. Khorsabat, Iraq. March 23rd, 1843. While excavating for archaeological treasures, a group of men led by French scientist Paul Emile Bata came upon the remains of a huge Assyrian palace and within it an abundance of Sumerian cuneiform inscriptions. When translated, the inscriptions told of what archaeologists believe to be the world's oldest civilization and a group of powerful beings called the Anunnaki. 
The Anunnaki was a term of the gods used by the ancient Sumerians, but the original form of it, it simply meant the sky people. It meant those that were connected with the stars. The Anunnaki were seen to be the givers of civilization to mortal kind, and they are described as having these shining eyes and having a radiance and an otherworldly feeling about them. Based on 30 years of studying the Sumerian cuneiform tablets, in 1976, author and researcher Zechariah Sitchin published a book called The Twelfth Planet, in which he proposed that the Sumerian gods were, in fact, refugees from another world. According to Sitchin's interpretation of the tablets, these alien visitors, the Anunnaki, created humankind. It appears to be that gods came down and literally started a colonization project here on Earth, creating us in their image and after their likeness. It also might stand to reason then that they've infused us with the desire to then spread this colonization project beyond Earth. I think if you look at what we've been doing in our space program, it's a blueprint for what may have happened here a long time ago with extraterrestrials. But I think we're on the same path. We're beginning to understand that the Anunnaki gods that were actually ETs could be still out throughout the universe. That we could now, as we are starting to head out into space, be encountering the prime intelligence that originally had civilizations on Earth and were working throughout this solar system. Dr. David Jacobs, who has interviewed hundreds of abduction victims, believes he's found evidence that aliens have been abducting us in order to manipulate our DNA for some dark and malevolent purpose. The hybrid okay. phenomenon, uh, which is a, a matter of, of reproduction, that is to say, uh, uh, DNA from, from humans is mixed with DNA from certain aliens to produce hybrids for some reason or another. They started probably when they first began abducting people. And that is probably in the last quarter of the 19th century. So we think that maybe 95% of abductees uh, don't know that they're abductees. They know they have had odd occurrences, but they don't know, they can't attach it to the abduction phenomenon. And a person is an abductee because their mother or their father was an abductee and their mother or father, the grandparents, so one of them or both of them might have been abductees. This is a global phenomenon. The main thing that they talked about, though, that was really uh, uh, sort of astounding was the procedures done to them. Abductees are give birth to hybrids and help hybrids. We do not know the reason why. That makes us a terminal species, so to speak, in my opinion. Uh, because that neurological control uh, to make you think or do or forget anything, this is a major existential threat, I think, uh, to humanity. Have aliens infiltrated our society? We were living on the beach in, in Pacific Palisades, and I walked up to the window and I saw this light on the horizon that I'd never seen before. You know, I'd lived on the beach my whole life, and it wasn't a boat, and it wasn't a star. Uh, I just watched this craft. The next thing I knew, it jetted into the stars and disappeared, and I went to bed as usual. I woke up in the middle of the night, and I was not in my bed any longer. I was naked, and I was paralyzed. The beings I saw were about three and a half feet tall, they were naked, they were off-white, they were not gray. They had huge heads, huge wrap-around black eyes, tiny little bodies. There are many stories of grays abducting humans into their spaceships, and even of being inseminated with alien reproductive material, and then conceiving human-alien hybrid babies and having those fetuses removed from their bodies and then grown on the alien spaceships. 
In some cases, people report going back onto the spaceship and being able to see these hybrid offspring. I was being used for my DNA. They were creating hybrid children from my eggs, someone else's sperm, and combining it with their DNA and their sperm. I would be implanted with an alien fetus, and they would leave the fetus in my body for a few months. Then they would bring me back again later, and then they would remove it. It was horrific. It was terrifying. You can't have so many people saying that they've been abducted and not have some possibility of truth with that. I think it's happening. I don't know if it's a hybridization program for these ETs or whether they're trying to bring these hybrids back to this planet one day when the environment changes. But in my opinion, something very strange is happening to these people who claim to be abducted. Are they scheming with some shadowy government agency? We had agreed to cooperate with the alien colonists by a majority vote taken by the group that your father and I worked for. A group that came together at the State Department on a project dating back to 1947 to Roswell. So with the alien vessels settling into orbit, the urgent question is, what do they want? Soon after the arrival, NASA detects massive amounts of sulfur dioxide being released by the alien craft. Within days, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration observes the planet is noticeably cooling. This causes much rejoicing. The aliens, it would seem, are here to save us from climate change. And hadn't they helped us before? But optimism soon turns to horror. The planet's temperatures are not just cooling, they are starting to plummet. Far from restoring our climate, the aliens are actually putting it into a deep freeze. Earth is under attack. Then comes an unexpected breakthrough. Remember those satellites that went dark when the alien ship showed up? One of them suddenly starts transmitting again, and the images it sends are out of this world, literally. The satellite had been sucked into the wormhole through which the alien ship had traveled, and it came out on the other side, wherever that was. It now finds itself bouncing back and forth from one end of the wormhole to the other. Earth scientists are able to take advantage of getting good images from what had to be the alien's mother planet. What do these images reveal? A planet much like Earth, only as it was 20,000 years ago, in the middle of the last ice age. Humanity now understands we are in a war for survival. communication comes from the alien craft, we still don't know if they are here to rule us or exterminate us. Already millions are dying in the bitter cold. With crops destroyed by frost, many more deaths will soon follow. The question is, can we fight back? As hopeless as it seems, Earth decides to strike back at the invaders. Thousands of missiles armed with conventional explosives are launched at once. Humanity anxiously watches and waits. But as the missiles reach the ship, smaller wormholes open up around it and absorb them. The counterattack fails. However, close examination reveals a surprise. A few of the missiles have managed to get through and succeed in slightly damaging the alien ship. So there is hope. They are vulnerable. But while the nations of Earth plan their next attack, one which will include nuclear weapons. The aliens hit back.
causing massive tsunamis in the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, which destroy many of the world's greatest cities, including New York, Tokyo, and Shanghai. Finally, a communication comes from the alien vessel, a message consisting of one word, surrender. Debate again rages. Can we fight back? The missile attack had done some damage. Perhaps the assumption that aliens have vastly superior technology is flawed. In Afghanistan, the primitive Taliban came into possession of some of the most advanced military tech in the world, including helicopters, drones, and fighter planes. So could the aliens likewise have obtained technology from some other more advanced civilization, just as the Taliban has come to possess weapons they didn't actually invent? A simple question catches fire. Suppose the invaders have learned how to travel galactic distances from another more advanced civilization. Might we also acquire this knowledge? Increasingly accepted by physicists is the theory that we actually live in a multiverse. Some scientists are now suggesting that the Big Bang is just one moment in an eternal cycle of cosmic creation and disillusion. Scientists are working on different theories to try and explain how the universe could have come into existence. One of these theories is that our universe is in fact one of many universes, or multiverses. This idea that that may lead to multiple universes, but it's still scientifically valid and there are people who do research into that, try and find out if there really are an infinite number of universes. This is no longer just speculative, there's actually science you can do. The question scientists are exploring is whether we can actually travel to any of these places or whether information can flow between one dimension and another. Looking at the rise of our species might shed some light. Homo sapiens first appeared in Africa about 300,000 years ago. Other species of humans such as Neanderthal and Homo erectus already populated the world outside Africa. And for the next 230,000 years, there seemed to be no reason to think Homo sapiens would replace them. Then suddenly something changed dramatically. Scientists refer to this as the cognitive revolution. It was not the size of the Homo sapien brain that changed. And in fact, Neanderthals boasted larger brains. No, it was something about the way we began using our brain. The mind-bending effects of psychedelics led to a radical reorganization of information in the primate mind jump-starting the mental evolution that led to the creation of language, art, and technology, which facilitated brain growth. Because magic mushrooms grow around cow dung, early humans who had domesticated cattle regularly embarked on hallucinogenic trips that helped them invent religious ritual, calendar-making, and magic. Graham Hancock argues in his book Supernatural that the cognitive revolution occurred when humans discovered psychedelic mushrooms and accessed information during altered states from another dimension. Anatomically modern humans began to walk the planet about 200,000 uh, years ago and exactly what evolutionary processes led to that are, are not clear. But what's, what's interesting is that even when the human brain is in its fully modern form, it is uh, the same size as our brains today, as far as we can tell, the same, the same structure, although it's difficult to know that absolutely from brain casts. Um, the behavior of these anatomically modern humans is barely recognizable as human in the way that we would define human behavior today. It's much more like the behavior uh, of those uh, hominids from, from earlier periods, going back three, four million years. Um, there's no innovation, there's no 
creativity. Uh, there doesn't seem to be a spark of the spiritual uh, in these people. They, they don't bury their dead. There's no sense of, a, of, of, of an afterlife. There's no art. There's no symbolism. Their use of stone tools is extremely limited and, and narrow. And they, they're really working with the same sort of toolkit that had been around for a million and a half years previous to the arrival of anatomically modern humans. So although they look like us, they just aren't like us at all. And this, this continues for another, another 100,000 years. And then it's really only about 100 or 110,000 years ago that you get the first hint that some kind of symbolic behavior is being, is being introduced. And I would say that that is one of the defining characteristics of the human being. Uh, is to manipulate and use uh, symbols, to be able to conceive in the abstract of something that is not there and present right in front of your face. 40,000 and 30,000 years ago, it's as though a light has been switched on in the human brain all over the world. Uh, and you get this extraordinary, breathtaking rock and cave art being engraved into rock surfaces, into cave walls, and painted using um, a mixture of colors, typically black and red, some yellows, um, and depicting from the very beginning, from, from the moment that this begins, uh, depicting beings that actually we do not see and our ancestors did not see in daily life. At the same time, you find uh, other changes in human behavior. Uh, our ancestors are in every way becoming instantly recognizable as human. And why that process is connected to what can rightly be described as the, the greatest leap forward in the evolution of human behavior in the entire six million year story of uh, human beings. Just no answers to those questions. And then in the 1980s, uh, a South African uh, professor, Professor David Lewis Williams, the University of Witwatersrand in South Africa, begins to propose uh, a different theory and he begins to work it and, and support it with evidence and gradually to win over his colleagues in the field. And that, and that theory is that the artists, that they were shamans whose business it is to commune with the other world. And, and what is the, the common denominator of, of shamans all around the world is the deliberate induction, control of and use of altered states of consciousness and that it's in these altered states of consciousness that they have fundamental experiences which are, which are in, in, in the tribal, the hunter-gatherer context, those, those experiences are integrated into daily life. If you wish to know where to go to find water, to bring rain, where the herds of game are congregated, enter the spirit world, gain the information there, come back to this realm and put it into practice. That, that what happens to us in altered states of consciousness, certainly what happens to me and, and uh, others who I know, uh, in an altered state of consciousness induced, for example, by ayahuasca uh, or by pure, pure DMT, uh, is that we are gaining insight and, uh, and a direct connection to another level of reality. As more alien ships begin to arrive and slowly move into positions over major world cities, some scientists begin asking this. Could the invaders have obtained their advanced technology in the same way our ancestors may have gained new knowledge thousands of years ago by accessing knowledge through an altered state? Scientists believe there must have been tens of billions of alien civilizations at some time in our galaxy alone. Imagine this possibility. Hundreds of millions of years ago, highly advanced alien beings sweep through the galaxy with the purpose of accelerating the rise of civilizations. They visit worlds where life has barely gotten off the ground, and like video game designers, they leave little bonuses for intelligent creatures to stumble upon little packets of knowledge that might be used by beings like us to level up, so to speak, as a player in a video game world. For example, we might gain knowledge of medicinal herbs, or maybe how to use seashells as money, or how to build a pyramid. Well, in the subtropics, the most common mushroom coming out of those cow patties is Philosophy Commences, a potent magic mushroom. One thing that mushrooms and other psychedelics do reliably is they induce a synesthesia. 
synesthesia is the perception of one sensory modality and another. Hearing colors, for example, or seeing music. have these profound experiences and you have to put yourself in their place and imagine what the impact of such an experience must have been on an early hominid. These magic mushrooms open up the floodgates of information you receive. Basically, you can think of it as a contact fluid between the synapses within the brain. Wow, what a competitive advantage, especially if you're working with the geometry of weapons or having to put together something that will give you a better chance of survival. The fact that this happened not once, not twice, but millions upon millions of times over millions of years is a very plausible explanation for the tripling of the brain two million years ago. It's not so simple to say that they ate psilocybin mushrooms and suddenly the brain mutated. I think it's more complex than that, but I think it was a factor. It was like a software to program this neurologically modern hardware to think, to have cognition, to have language. Because language is essentially synesthesia. Language is an association with inherently meaningless sound, except that it's associated with the complex of meaning. A great deal of the brain's real estate, you might say, is devoted to the generation and or the comprehension of language. Those neural structures are not found in our ancestors. That's a human trait, to have so much physiology devoted to generating and understanding language. And that's a reflection of evolutionary events that made us what we are. But while scientists are wondering if we might be able to access more of these bonuses and level up for our coming battle against the invaders, Earth's leaders send a message to the aliens. We surrender. The leaders of Earth decide surrender is the most rational course of action. Of course, not everyone agrees. Pockets of resistance form, and research secretly goes on. A small group of scientists working in secret begin taking massive doses of DMT intravenously. They enter altered states, journeying into unexplored regions of consciousness. Some of these explorers meet disaster, and their minds blow apart, leaving them a drooling vegetable. But others find success, and they return with miraculously expanded consciousness. As is often the case, science fiction had anticipated this, and Frank Herbert's Dune, which takes place thousands of years in the future, humans have spread throughout the galaxy. Their spacecraft achieve light speed through bending time and space but they require specially conditioned people called navigators to guide them. What enables them to do this is a unique spice called melange. Breathing in heavy doses of this spice on a regular basis, navigators mutate into hideous form, but also develop what Herbert calls prescience, the ability to see just a little into the future. With this talent, they can navigate at warp speed without running into any space objects. Let's come back to 2025. The world's nations are surrendering, but rebel scientists are expanding their minds through DMT and are becoming our first navigators. However, without the technology to travel at light speed, a breakthrough is needed somewhere else. And the DMT training, unfortunately, is no help. Let's go back to early Homo sapiens confined to Africa for a couple of hundred thousand years scraping out a meager existence while trying to avoid being eaten by superior predators such as lions and hyenas. And then something changes. 
Suddenly, they spread out from the continent, actually replacing early humans such as Neanderthals, even though those beings were stronger and actually had bigger brains. As we've seen, somehow Homo sapiens became more communicative and more aggressive. To understand how this happened, we need to go somewhere creepy. We need to talk about bugs. There's a mysterious parasite scientists have been studying for a century that infects as much as half the human population. In fact, if you've ever owned a cat, it probably infects you right now. There's no way to remove it from your brain. Sorry. And it does change your behavior. Toxoplasma gondii needs to reproduce inside the stomachs of cats and it has found a clever way to travel from the stomach of one cat to another, through mice. Toxoplasma spores exit cats in their waste material, and when mice eat grain in the field, some of those spores find themselves within a new and temporary home. However, they need to get back to cat stomachs, so they make their way to the mouse's brain, where they do something incredible. They rewire it. Mice are, of course, born with an instinctual fear of their feline nemesis, the cat. However, after this rewiring, the disposition of the mouse changes. Now Jerry becomes a big fan of Tom. Infected mice, against all instincts, start seeking out cats. Not surprisingly, they end up as cat meals, and the toxoplasma finds itself where it needs to be, back inside a feline stomach. But what effect does this parasite have on the human brain? Interestingly, it makes people less risk-averse, more likely to take chances, experiment, and explore, more likely to leave Africa, conquer the world, and build empires, empires with cities, civilization. Remember that hypothetical ancient alien race we discussed, the one which visited our planet back when life was nothing more than single-cell creatures? Like computer programmers, these advanced aliens inserted bits of algorithm into the genetic code of life. Algorithms that would pay off down the road when intelligent creatures evolve. We've already seen that our brains are strangely attuned to DMT, the so-called spirit molecule. This might be the result of alien tinkering. Well, might alien tinkering also be at the root of Toxoplasma gondii? If so, what might we learn from that microscopic parasite? As Earth surrenders to the alien invaders, the question becomes urgent. The answer is found in something called junk DNA. 75 to 95% of DNA in living organisms serves no known purpose. Many scientists have long speculated that there actually might be encoded messages left within junk DNA by very ancient aliens. These aliens might have visited Earth when life was in the formative stage, or they might even have spread this code throughout the galaxy in a process called panspermia. With panspermia, tiny packets of genetic code are spread through space dust and meteors. Francis Crick, the Nobel Prize winning discoverer of the DNA double helix, argued an ancient alien race did this to spread life through the universe. Now, as mankind faces extinction or enslavement, rebel scientists finally take a serious look at this junk DNA. And where better to start than Toxoplasma gondii, a strange parasite that may have sparked the rise of our species and the dawn of civilization itself. As it turns out, it doesn't even require a particularly advanced computer to find what we need. Equations sitting there all along right inside the junk DNA of the mysterious parasite. The Gandhi genomic sequences are searched for equations using AI programs, and the results are stunning. They find sophisticated yet simple equations that physicists immediately recognize. Of course, they are equations that are more advanced than the ones currently understood by human science. Equations relating to something called Einstein-Rosen bridges also known as wormholes. With Earth descending into an ice age and alien overlords enslaving the population, Earth prepares to strike back. Deep within a secret ocean location, a wormhole is opened. And going through that wormhole, navigated by special engineers whose consciousness has been leveled up by DMT-altered states, sails an Ohio-class submarine. 
loaded with 24 ballistic missiles, each armed with four nuclear warheads, enough to destroy much of an Earth-sized world. The universe consists of patterns that repeat from the smallest elements to the largest. The Ohio-class submarine, navigated by engineers whose consciousness is vastly expanded by DMT exploration, arrive in the ocean of the alien planet. Probes are launched, the surface mapped, and alien cities found. Images of these cities are returned to Earth and relayed to our new alien masters, who soon pack their bags, board their ships, and go home. During the Cold War, this was called MAD, Mutual Assured Destruction. The idea was to aim thousands of nuclear missiles at each other, and either side understood if they launched an attack, there would be a full counterattack, and both sides would be destroyed. This deterred anyone from initiating an attack. The arrival of the Polaris submarine on the alien planet achieved the same result, leading to stalemate, negotiation, and uneasy peace. This pattern repeats throughout nature, from the tiniest organisms to the largest. Living things spread out, conquer, compete for resources, and build the fences against more powerful neighbors. From bacteria to birds, fungi to primates, as humans, we are learning to value sustainable relationships. However, we would do well to remember that certain things are woven into the fabric of the universe. Expansion, competition, and yes, invasion.